So good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is one of the very important surgical infection. And uh, many times in the exam, we love to ask from this topic. This is a serious infection. Okay. Now let's move further. Now let's introduce the topic first. The other terms for necrotizing fasciitis in surgical uh, you know, treatment or management are flesh-eating disease, flesh-eating bacteria, or flesh-eating bacteria syndrome. So usually it is known as flesh-eating disease. Now flesh means muscle. So already you got the meaning. This is such a serious infection that muscles are necrosed in no time and it is rapidly spreading in that particular area. Now, how does it spread? It is spread through the facial plane, okay? It's spread through the facial plane. Now, let me ask you one question. What do you mean by fascia? What is fascia? Yes? Fascia is uh, the structure which separates the muscles from another muscle. Okay, good. Fascia is a structure that uh, separates the skin and muscle. Okay, fine, fine. Okay. Now, the right, actually, fascia is present deeper than the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And it is a sheet like a structure which okay, covers the muscle. In other, uh, you know, way, I can describe fascia as a flat type of tendon okay a bit of you know a flat type of a tendon like it's not really that but it is a membrane which covers the muscle and it is uh, separating that muscle from the other structure like uh, skin and subcutaneous tissue now let's come back to the topic here this necrotizing fasciitis uh, is spread along the facial plane means it is spread very fast there and in a very short period of time, it can involve a large area. Now, this is a spreading infection of deeper layer of the skin, deep fascia, and soft tissue with extensive destruction and toxemia. So this is necrotizing fasciitis. This is considered a surgical emergency. It is a type of surgical emergency. So whenever you suspect any patient with uh, necrotizing fasciitis, okay, quickly, take the patient to the operation theater and debride the wound or debride that particular area which is infected. This is called debridement. Now, this term is not new for you, okay? Because few of the topics in surgery are already taught to you. Debridement means, okay, surgical removal of those, you know, tissue which are dead and devitalized, which are dead or devitalize okay all those dirty stuff there which is not useful for our body anymore should be removed if we do not remove them the wound okay or that infection is never going to heal uh, one perfect example is necrotizing fasciitis now look at the organism here 80 percent of the necrotizing fasciitis case occur because of polymicrobial organism multiple organism together some of them are aerobe some of them are anaerobe some of them are gram positive some of them are gram negative so they are polymicrobial in nature so a quick you know uh, knowledge you have gained here whenever you choose antibiotics for the treatment of this uh, surgical emergency condition you should choose broad spectrum antibiotic which act against different group of bacteria. Some should act against gram positive, some should act against gram negative, and others should act against anaerobe. Remember this because this is a polymicrobial. Now look at the name Streptococci, Staphylococci, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Proteus, and Clostridium. Now among them, among them, Streptococci and Staphylococci are gram positive cocci okay see that the name itself says they are cocci isn't it gram positive cocci now e coli pseudomonas and proteus these are gram negative bacilli 
gram negative bacilli. They are a rod shaped structure. So we call them bacilli and clostridium is a bacilli, but it is gram positive. Clostridium is a gram positive bacilli. So I'm sure you have already studied this in microbiology. Have you? Yes or no? In the last semester, right? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Okay. Yes, I know the, the, the real, you know, on time classes could not be taken. It was also online classes in other subjects. So I'm not sure, you know, how detailed you have learned there. But these are very, very important knowledge. Okay. So if somebody is still uh, in a confusion, uh, then they should revise this. This gram positive, gram negative, cocci, bacilli, very, very important one. Now, 80% have a history of previous trauma or infection here. What does that mean? This is known as predisposing factor. Now, necrotizing fasciitis, okay, can occur without any predisposing factor in around 20% of the cases. But in majority of them, uh, there is a prior lesion there. There is a prior wound, okay, or prior trauma. So this is important point in the history. And lower limb is the commonest site in 60% of the case. Maybe around the thigh area, maybe around the leg area, okay, uh, sometimes even in the perineal area. So we'll talk about this when we move further. Now, why this is considered a surgical emergency? Number one, it is extensively okay, damaging the local area. That means whatever skin, subcutaneous tissue, fascia, and the muscle, whatever present there, they will be destroyed. Number one. And number two, along the facial plane, it can rapidly spread to another site. And in no time, the person will suffer from septicemia and septic shock. Septicemia and septic shock. Now, once septic shock occurs, okay, it is very difficult to treat the patient. We'll talk about this shock in our coming upcoming chapters. Okay, septic shock is one of the very, very difficult conditions to treat. So there is high chance of death. Urgent resuscitation, antibiotics, and surgical debridement is essential for the proper management. Now see this, resuscitation. Resuscitation means if the patient is in shock, we need to manage the shock because this is the paramount importance thing now, isn't it? Always, whenever a sick patient comes to you, remember A, B, and C. A means airway. B is breathing, C is circulation. Now let's hope A and B are fine here okay, because this is a flesh eating disease. So probably lung and airway are normal. So C for circulation. Circulation means what is the blood pressure? What is the pulse rate? What is the strength or volume of the pulse? If they are altered, then we need to give IV fluid in a good amount. Always in the beginning, it will be crystalloid. And later on, if crystalloid doesn't, you know, uh, show the improvement, then colloid. Colloid means blood and other heavy type of fluid. So this is called resuscitation. Okay, that's the meaning. Antibiotics, no need of any discussion. This is caused by polymicrobial organism. So antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotic, powerful type of antibiotics are used. And probably, the most important management here is surgical debridement. We need to remove all those dead tissues from there. Then only the patient has a hope of surviving. Okay, so we'll talk about this towards the end of this topic. This is an introductory slide. Okay, and it is clearly giving you what this disease is all about. Mortality rate, 30 to 50%. And there is one condition which is known as Fournier's gangrene. Now, this Fournier's gangrene is a type or one form of necrotizing fasciitis, which affects the perineal region, perianal region, and genital region. So let me say a little bit more about it. Probably in the, in the last topic which we discussed, that is gas gangrene, 
one of the picture was shown of Fourniers gangrene, if you remember. This Fourniers gangrene is also caused by polymicrobial organism. Okay, in this condition, mainly the scrotum is affected. Scrotum. Once the skin of the scrotum is dead, okay, or necrosis, what happens? The testicle would be exposed outside. Okay, the testicle would be exposed outside. And that infection will spread okay, in the perineal area, on the back side, towards the anal area, and sometimes even towards the thigh area. This is called perineum. So, Fourniers gangrene is one of the very, very you know, uh, difficult conditions to treat. It is considered as one form of necrotizing fasciitis in that region. A very important MCQ question in the exam Fourniers gangrene. Now, let's move on. Now see here, though you already uh, have seen some of the name of the bacteria in the previous slide. Okay, now let's revise a little bit again. Regarding the etiology of uh, necrotizing fasciitis, there are two types depending on the causative organism. We call them type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is more common than type 2. Okay, see here. Uh, type 1 is polymicrobial infection. This is a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic organism. Now, these are, you know, some of them are written here. Uh, Pseudomonas. Here, Pseudomonas, okay. Staphylococcus, bacteroids, and anaerobic streptococci like pepro streptococci. Now, Pseudomonas is aerobic organism. Staphylococcus aureus is also aerobe. Bacteroids and peptostreptococci are anaerobe. So this is how we differentiate them. Okay. And uh, what type of uh, uh, you know organism is pseudomonas according to Gram stain? Yes, pseudomonas. It's obligate. Obligate. Yes, yes, obligate. Gram positive or gram negative? I just want that answer. Now, pseudo this is gram negative. Gram positive. Gram negative. Okay. Now, see here. Pseudomonas, okay, is gram negative bacilli. Gram negative bacilli. Just like E. coli and Klebsiella or Proteus. Gram negative bacilli. Staphylococcus aureus is a gram positive cocci gram positive cocci very easy bacteroids is again gram positive organisms and then anaerobic streptococci like pepto streptococci are always gram positive okay they are always gram positive streptococci and staphylococci are gram positive now this is polymicrobial what about the monomicrobial they are con like uh, called as type 2 and they are generally due to either group A streptococci or Clostridium perfringens or Staph aureus, either any one of them. That's why they are called monomicrobial. Though the name of three bacteria are written here, it doesn't mean they, uh, they, they cause the infection together. Okay, any one of them may be causing the infection there. Now, Clostridium perfringens is the same organism which we discussed in the last class. It is the causative agent of gas gangrene. Clostridium perfringens, a uh, typical organism which falls under anaerobic group, anaerobic group, Clostridium. And this uh, occurs only about 20% of the cases. So polymicrobial infection is more common than monomicrobial one. Okay, let's move further. Now, in the beginning, okay, or in the introductory uh, slides, I told you in majority of the cases, there would be predisposing conditions. Like, let's talk about those predisposing conditions. What are those? Some of them are local factors. Some of them are systemic factors. Regarding the local factors, there may be penetrating trauma. Now, penetrating means it's a deep type of trauma, which may be caused by a sharp weapon, okay? But it is not a cutting type of injury. It's a penetrating type of injury. 
a good example is a bullet wound okay or a knife wound now recent injury any type of surgery or injury okay recent surgery or injury also can cause iv drug abuse iv drug abuse in that area where they are you know injecting the drug that may be a predisposing condition for uh, a necrotizing fasciitis the common site for iv drug abuse is elbow area in the elbow area they often inject okay the drugs with with the help of a syringe and needle of course and some of them may be injecting in the thigh as well or even in the wrist chronic venous ulceration now chronic venous ulceration the meaning of this is venous ulcers are quite common after varicose vein now you know what are varicose vein the varicose vein are dilated and tortuous vein and when those varicose vein are not treated in time okay the overlying skin may be ulcerated this is venous ulceration it may be a predisposing site for necrotizing fasciitis arterial insufficiency the blood flow in that artery is not proper now there are so many example we can give like thrombosis of the major artery embolism of that artery atherosclerosis of that artery something known as burgers disease which you have studied in pathology burgers disease also known as thromboangitis obliterans okay thromboangitis obliterans some condition known as renard phenomena or renards disease so many important example i can give you okay even diabetes can result in arterial insufficiency not directly but secondarily probably because of atherosclerosis formation now when arterial insufficiency occur the area which is supplied by that artery will be ischemic and that ischemic area may become ulcerated now now that can be a site for a necrotizing fasciitis another local factor would be skin damage or infection there like abrasion bite or even boils abrasion means very superficial type of trauma bite any animal bite okay or insect bite and boils can you uh, this boils can be a two thing this boils can be okay because of burn because of burn the boil may be there but the common medical term for boil is what we have studied this before yes furuncle yes this is furuncle excellent this is called furuncle boil is another term for furuncle furuncle is a localized infection okay of the hairy area so this may may act as a predisposing factor sometimes another may be pressure sore now this pressure sore is also known as bed sore okay bed sore very commonly used term bed sore see here now why it is called bed sore and which type of patient develop pressure sore and the answer is these pressure sores are developed by terminally ill and debilitated patient who cannot move themselves or who cannot turn themselves on the bed okay like a paralyzed patient for example very very ill and sick patient that's what i i i said terminally ill and debilitated patient if we do not take care of those people or patient then some particular area which are pressurized against the bed okay will remain like that for a long time then those area will be ischemic and some ulcer will form there this is called pressure sore or bed sore very very difficult condition to treat now even more important are systemic factors now let's talk about them have a look here immunodeficiency like hiv and aids steroid use this is corticosteroid use for a long time diabetes mellitus major burns and even smokers all of these are considered as a systemic factor many of them make that patient immunocompromised as a result of this this serious infection can occur now let's move further let's talk about what are the signs and symptoms of necrotizing fasciitis 
what type of disease is this according to the clinical features over 70 percent of the cases occurs in at least one of the following clinical situation so we already talked about these are called predisposing factors like immunosuppressive condition this is a one of the favorite questions of the examiner give me some of the examples of immunosuppressed or immunocompromised condition yes i want to hear some answer now hiv diabetes mellitus yes pregnancy okay any anything else some use of anti anti inflammatory uh, immunosuppression drugs aha uh -huh. corticosteroids yes. good good now very good so many students have answered correctly okay but i will i like to teach you a little bit here because there is no hurry and you know we need to cover all our bases okay because this type of questions can be asked in any subject by any teacher so immunosuppression is roughly divided into primary immunodeficiency disorder and secondary immunodeficiency disorder share primary and secondary the primary immunodeficiency or immunosuppressive disorder means these are already there they run in the family like a hereditary conditions or there are some type of genetic diseases a few of the example okay are x link a gamma globulinemia x link a gamma globulinemia this is a x link condition and in that situation there is no gamma globulin present gamma globulin means antibody so serious situation another example common variable immunodeficiency disorder severe combined immunodeficiency disorder d george syndrome probably you have heard the name before d george syndrome so all of these are primary immunodeficiency disorder now secondary very easy question think about those situation which comes later on in life and they make that patient immunocompromised like hiv and aids wonderful like diabetes mellitus very good then chronic steroid use chronic steroid use A steroid is uh, given in so many conditions these days and chronic intake of steroid okay definitely makes this patient immuno compromise some other conditions would be terminal cases of cancer connective tissue disorder failure of major organ system in our body okay failure of major organ system in our body so all of these are the causes of secondary immunodeficiency disorder this is a favorite question in the exam now some of them are repeated here again like diabetes okay, diabetes mellitus alcoholism or chronic alcoholism which can lead to chronic okay uh, uh, chronic liver disease or cirrhosis of the liver the people who are abusing drug and people who are chronic smokers malignancies and chronic systemic disease so most of the thing which i already told all of most of uh, these are actually the secondary causes of immunodeficiency disorder the primary causes are not mentioned here okay but we should not forget them now only occasionally it occurs in people with an apparently normal general condition usually it occurs if there are some risk factor and those risk factors are immunodeficiency situation the infection begin locally at a site of trauma that that trauma can be a minor or a major one which we have already listed remember those local factors which act like a predisposing factor for necrotizing fasciitis let's move further now in the beginning okay what happens in the beginning there is intense pain and there are signs of inflammation in that local area there is fever and there is tachycardia as well as signs of cellulitis now there is intense pain in that local area and signs of inflammation all the signs of inflammation would be there like it would be red okay there there is swelling okay there is heat so these are classical signs of inflammation along with the patient is febrile if we measure the temperature it would be high more than 30 really degrees centigrade more than aaj ke ghar mein nasht ho raha tha 
Okay, I mu muted all of you. Now, so I'm talking about there is high grade fever or sometimes maybe low grade in the beginning. And as a result of this, there is tachycardia as well as signs of cellulitis. Now cellulitis is a deeper type of infection of the subcutaneous region. Now in the early stage, the signs of inflammation may not be very apparent if the infection is quite deep within the tissue. Now, if they are already in the facial plane and they have not come up, okay, the signs of inflammation may not be apparent. Apparent means visible. They, they occur inside the area, but we cannot see them from outside. That's the meaning. And a bit later on, because of the rapidity okay, of this disease, the signs of inflammation will be seen. Now, with progression of the disease, which occur often within hours, the progression of the disease occur within hours, because this is a rapidly progressing disease, tissue become progressively swollen, the skin become discolored, and it starts to develop blisters. Now, this is an important point for the diagnosis. See here, there is discoloration of the skin. Now, this discoloration in many of the cases is black in color. So, the necros tissue look blacker in color. And this is how we can reach to the diagnosis. And because of those gas forming organism, there is blister formation as well. And inside those blister, uh, inside those blister, there is collection of the gas. Okay, now see here. Crepitus may be present. Now, crepitus is a sensation, is a feeling. When we touch that area, there is a crackling sensation which is felt by our finger. That is called crepitus. And this crepitus is produced because of the gas collection there. Okay. The gas which is locally formed is causing crepitus. If there is a discharge of the fluid, it looks like dishwater. Okay. It looks like dishwater, means it is not clear. It is not a serous type of fluid. It's a dirty looking fluid. Why it is dirty? Because the death of the tissue there. Okay, the tissues are dead. Diarrhea and vomiting are also common symptom because of sepsis, because the infection doesn't localize in that area. It may spread. Now, skin color may progress to violet and blisters okay, and ultimately, Necrosis occur, and at this uh, you know situation or condition, it will appear black. Furthermore, the patient has fever. Okay, fever will continuously increasing, and patient look very ill. Within few hours, patient look very ill. Now, this ill a type of patient uh, can have septic shock inside, and if we fail to diagnose this and uh, fail to manage this in time, uh, high chance of death. Look at mortality rate is 73 percent if left untreated. Exactly not 73 percent in every situation. There may be a range, but if even if you cannot remember this, just remember this is a lethal type of infection with high mortality. Without surgery and medical assistance like antibiotic, the infection will rapidly progress and will eventually lead to death in almost 100 percent of the case. What does that mean? If we do not treat there is 100% mortality. It doesn't recover on its own. So we have to do something. And that something means management, the proper management. Use broad spectrum antibiotic. Take the patient in time to the hospital. Diagnose it in time. Do extensive debridement. Okay. Uh, if there is shock, go for the treatment. Hyperbaric oxygen use. All these things can be done. Now, let's see. Uh, some of the uh, picture, okay. So here, let me highlight this for you. Now, just try to understand this, okay. This is a a, a good picture. Some of the you know later you probably cannot see it. It's a bit uh, dim actually, okay. A bit of faded, but the meaning is important here. This is skin, okay. This is skin. This is fat, which is present in subcutaneous tissue. Subcutaneous tissue, there's a lot of fat there. 
and deeper deeper to that is a muscle now fascia is covering the muscle the fascia is covering the muscle now this is a area which is taken from our chest so this is the area right so uh, this muscle is pectoralis major muscle okay then this small muscle which is even deeper inside is pectoralis minor so pectoralis major and pectoralis minor now they are covered or separated by fascia and deeper it's a rib cage okay now in this area if necrotizing fasciitis occur now what does it do and how does the infection spread that what we are talking right now now this blue sorry this green color green color is the infection this green color is the infection you remember like this now this is a facial plane which is infected in the beginning and in no time see there it is coming up towards the surface okay the infection is coming up towards the surface and it will definitely reach the skin it will cause big ulcer there and a big wound and all this tissue will be necros and dead so this type of condition is necrotizing fasciitis now another uh, picture okay another picture which is of the lower limb now have a look there now it doesn't look good does it see there this is a big you know wound and all the skin and the deeper tissues are lost okay they are lost see this big area we don't find any tissues there and the deeper tissues are exposed and see here uh, it starts like this so this is necrotizing fasciitis of left lower extremity now this is a person with necrotizing fasciitis and the left leg shows extensive redness and necrosis and look at this color of the skin okay it is black it's a patchy type of black discoloration here it is still a bit red a bit violet in color so extensively spreading type of infection so this is you know not that bad as the previous one probably that that case was derided in the hospital but if we uh, uh, transport this patient into the hospital as soon as possible and do extensive debridement and treatment probably we can save the life of this patient now this is how debridement is done in the operation theater now, this is called debridement now debridement means removal of dead and devitalized tissue from a region now with the help of scalpel the help of scissors and everything okay they are removing all the dirty looking tissue there and keep only the healthy one this is called debridement and extensive debridement has to be done in this case now, after this you don't close the wound now okay you don't close the wound you keep it open never close the wound in this type of infective condition now this is a necrotizing fasciitis which is producing gas in the soft tissue now this is a ct scan so ct is it showing uh, the gas there okay. it's showing the gas there see this 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 black uh, color area is the collection of the gas now what are the investigation you like to do okay so see there all of you please focus on your screen now there are some blood test which we should do routinely if a patient with necrotizing fasciitis comes to the hospital these are cbc now leukocytosis is a part of cbc or leukocyte count i should say and in this condition because it is caused by bacterial infection so there is leukocytosis so what do we mean by leukocytosis so what is leukocytosis Sorry, Sir, it's a green color of the disease. Number of leukocytes from normal. Okay, so 
So this is the easiest question I can ask you. This is the easiest question. Leukocytosis is the high WBC count. High or raised WBC count than the normal is called leukocytosis. There are different types of WBC. The most important are neutrophil, then lymphocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, and the basophil. Now, it depends which type of infection we are talking about. In this case, okay, this is a bacterial infection. So, neutrophilia, leukocytosis with neutrophilia is the result. Now, CRP. Now, C reactive protein. Now, let me ask you one question. I'm not sure whether you know this or not. If CRP is high than the normal, what does that mean? What does it denote or what does it show? Sir, it shows there is some inflammation. Any inflammatory. It is a CD going on. Very good. So, all of you are answering quite correctly. Excellent. This CRP is a type of protein which is synthesized by the liver. It's a type of protein which is synthesized by the liver. And this protein is raised in case of inflammation and infection. So it is also known as acute phase reactant. Acute phase reactant. Okay. Similarly, hemoglobin is a part of a CBC. Then sodium, okay, or serum electrolytes should be done. And blood glucose is the standard part of the investigation here because the person may be a diabetic case. Now, I want to, you know, uh, give you a little bit more knowledge in glucose analysis. Now, for the diagnosis of diabetes, okay, for the diagnosis of diabetes, the blood sugar label can be done in two different ways. One is called fasting blood sugar, fasting blood sugar, and another is called postprandial one. So fasting, blood sugar, and we call it postprandial. Means after the meal, postprandial. Now fasting blood sugar, okay? If, if fasting blood sugar is more than, okay, 126 milligram per deciliter, then uh, this portion is diabetic. And if postprandial blood sugar is more than 200, more than 200 milligram per deciliter, then there is a high chance that this person may be a diabetic. But with symptom, okay, just one reading may be enough. Without symptom, you should have two readings which are high. So these are the important points. All of these we will we'll teach you later on also. But you know, if you know from right now, it will be very easy. Let's move on. Another is raise urea and creatinine. We do this uh, because this is a serious type of infection. It may cause sepsis, septicemia, as well as septic shock. We want to rule out how kidneys are functioning. Hypoalbuminemia. Decrease albumin level in the blood. So to make sure there is hypoalbuminemia, do serum albumin level. In this condition, there is acidosis. This is mainly metabolic type of acidosis. And metabolic acidosis is, you know, diagnosed by low pH, okay? Decreased bicarbonate level. These are the two important points. Altered coagulation profile. This is a, you know, a part of DIC. Serious infection can lead to DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So if I do all these coagulation profile, that can be abnormal. Like there may be decreased platelet count, there may be uh, increased bleeding time or clotting time, increased prothrombin time, increased partial thromboplastin time, and all those things. So these are the important blood tests. Now, another is a plain radiography. We can go for this, means plain X-ray. There is soft tissue gas seen if we do plain x ray, and this soft tissue gas is because of clostridial myonecrosis. It is because of clostridial myonecrosis. Now, see here. Now, which clostridium is responsible for myonecrosis? Let me ask this easy question for you which is that? 
clostridium perfringens are also called gas ganglion very good clostridium very good yes in the last class only we talked about this the name of the organism is clostridium perfringens okay 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 now another investigation we can go for is mri okay magnetic resonance imaging mri it so soft tissue necrosis it so soft tissue necrosis because this is a serious infection so mri would show soft tissue damage or necrosis there so it may be helpful another is a type of biopsy in seasonal or ex seasonal biopsy so in seasonal biopsy means you only take a bit of tissue there by giving a incision okay we take a tissue there excision means you take almost the whole tissue from there you remove that tissue okay you excise that tissue from there and send to the pathology lab anything can be done and there are uh, you know a different site where we can do this this can be done at the bed site but preferably it should be done in the operation theater this theater means operation theater or operation room because we can do extensive debridement inside the operation theater okay and at the same time send that tissue to the pathology lab as well now what they do in the pathology lab one they study about the tissue this is called histological confirmation they study about it second they can go for culture and sensitivity test which organism is responsible and this is mainly done by microbiology lab so they can send this sample to the microbiology lab which can a uh, culture the tissue and then find out the sensitivity test now you may be wondering what is this sensitivity test all about the sensitivity test means if any bacteria is grown from the culture we should make sure which antibiotics work against that bacteria this is called sensitivity test without this test we don't know which which antibiotic to prescribe in this patient but remember one thing i am not saying you wait for that sensitivity report and then only prescribe the antibiotic never this is a very serious infection i will never do that i will start right away the broad spectrum antibiotic but still uh, send the culture and after that sensitivity report come then i can change the antibiotics if they are not working so this is the way now let's talk about how to make a diagnosis of a necrotizing fasciitis now regarding the diagnosis okay one of the very important point this is a clinical diagnosis it's a clinical one when we examine the patient all those clinical features rapidly spreading infection the patchy type of necrosis occurring on the skin which is swollen there so this of course a good surgeon or a good doctor will definitely think this may be a case of necrotizing fasciitis but they have devised one score system okay one score system and this score system is all about what is the chance of that cellulitis to develop into necrotizing fasciitis in the beginning we already know there is it look like a cellulitis but what is the chance of that cellulitis to you know uh, emerge into necrotizing fasciitis this information is given by this score now look at here this score is called the laboratory risk indicator for necrotizing fasciitis l r i n e c in the short form okay see that l r i and this nec is from necrotizing so this score uh, you know has six serological measures so six different parameters are there one is crp or c reactive protein just now i told you this is a type of acute phase reactant so definitely it should be high here total wbc count okay it is also high this is called leukocytosis hemoglobin usually low sodium okay it it depends whether the sodium uh, is low or normal so we'll talk about it a bit later creatinine which is called the serum creatinine 
this is a part of renal function test and glucose so these are six serological measures or parameter and i score which is more than 6 or equal to 6 more or equal to 6 indicate that necrotizing fasciitis should be seriously considered in the cellulitis condition now till now we have not you know discussed how this score of 6 we get isn't it now we know the principle but let's talk about how we get this score of 6 see here all of you please focus on this slide now These are the scoring criteria. Now CRP, okay, if it is more than 150 milligram per liter, okay, then we will give four points for this. This is a high level of CRP. Regarding the WBC count, less than 15,000, okay, this is in thousand, less than 15,000, no point. So zero point between 15,000 to 25,000, one point, and more than 25,000 is two points. So what information you get? Usually the WBC count is quite high in this condition. Okay, but in the beginning it may be low. Means lesser than 15,000. You know, it's it's already a bit high than the normal. Remember, the normal count is up to 11,000. From the 11 to 15 we would don't give any score here regarding the hemoglobin okay, hemoglobin in gram per deciliter okay see this more than 13.5 doesn't get any point because this is a normal hemoglobin now less than 13.5 till 11 is one point and less than 11 is two point this is anemic case anemic case uh, you know have a, a slightly you know lesser ability to fight against the infection Another one, sodium level, millimole per liter is the unit. So less than 135 millimole per liter, we give two points. Because the normal level of sodium is 135 to 145 millimole per liter. So less than 135 is directly two points. Regarding the serum creatinine level, okay, it is micromole per liter. Micromole per liter, the upper level is around 107 to 108 micromole per liter so it is high here more than 141 so it it will get two points and regarding the glucose level okay again in millimole per liter if it is more than 10 it will get one point now the normal amount of glucose in the blood it depends whether you are taking fasting blood sugar or random blood sugar okay now one one point i like to you know share with you is 18 milligram of blood sugar is equivalent to one millimole. 18, one eight. 18 milligram of blood sugar is equivalent to one millimole. So how much 10 millimole means how much blood sugar level in milligram now? Yes. 180. Exactly, 180, isn't it? Very good, 180. So I'm just checking whether you are listening here or not, okay? So it's 180. So if it is more than 180 milligram per deciliter, then uh, probably the person is having, uh, you know, chance of diabetes. Or if we take the random blood sugar, the person may be diabetic. Okay, in random blood sugar, more than 180 is abnormal, definitely. Only in postprandial one, it is still within the not in the diabetic range, I should say. So all of these points we add together, and if we get a score of six more than six or equal to six okay then we can say yes this cellulitis has a high chance of getting into necrotizing fasciitis so let's treat this case as a necrotizing fasciitis that's the meaning now let's see uh, some of the picture and let's talk about the management part now this is a necrotizing you know fasciitis See that in the beginning, it is like this. So many people may ignore this at this stage. When, okay, when they were taken to the hospital, see that after 24 hours, 
just one day okay it has become this now this is not a surgical debridement now why it is not a surgical debridement there is one very important clue for you look at the tissue here this tissue looks infected this tissue looks very dirty and if we have done debridement it never looks like this debridement means only clean healthy looking tissue would be left behind so this is done by the disease itself that's why this is called flesh eating disease so all the muscles whatever tissue is here is gone now is necrosed they are lost so very serious condition now i will look here see this see this forearm and the arm again near the elbow area we can see some blisters here we can see different color or discoloration on the skin okay some black patchy areas are already seen so extensive debridement debridement has to be done to save this limb or to save the life of this patient now another very okay. serious okay another very serious type of uh, you know case here already uh, a lot of fleshes have been eaten there is a, a very dirty looking tissues there yeah. now see here okay please uh, mute, please mute yourself guys yeah. okay now see this now look at this the color okay this is a uh, necrosis or you can also call it gangrenous okay this is a gangrenous skin and underneath this okay look at this the muscle is already involved now let's move on see here the extensive involvement of the body and the arm and here the tissues has already been lost so this is a very serious type of case that what we want to say all the time now the last part is the management the management can be discussed under different headings okay first is initial management or you can call it general management then specific management okay something like that so what is the initial management we like to do here urgency in all aspect because prognosis decreases sharply with time so urgency means you just you just you know should be quick in the approach for example you are in the hospital okay right now you are uh, drinking a, a cup of coffee okay in the canteen and this type of patient comes and you you answer to your sister no i don't have a, i'm i'm a bit you know busy now uh, can i come after 15 to 20 minutes nothing like that you should run towards the emergency department this is called urgency and after reaching there you evaluate the case quite quickly and act accordingly if the patient needs debridement okay prepare the patient then take the patient into the operation room that is called urgency iv fluid resuscitation is very much necessary because many of these patients are already in shock so enough or good amount of iv fluid should be given and let me uh, remind you once again the initial type of iv fluid is crystalloid either normal saline or lactate ringer the early medical treatment is often presumptive okay often presumptive presumptive means we don't know what is the causative agent till now okay so this is also known as empirical therapy so which antibiotic should we choose then isn't it this is presumptive or empirical therapy now there is one guideline which is provided here the combination of iv antibiotics may include piperacillin with tazobactam combination vancomycin and clindamycin i'm sure you have studied all these name in pharmacology now piperacillin and tazobactam are given for which organism anybody anyone okay so let me unmute you maybe i have muted you there okay one second
Yes. Now we can answer. Piperacillin. Pseudo. Yes, yes. That's pseudo. Pseudo monas. Pseudo monas. Pseudo monas. Pseudo. Very good. Excellent. This is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Piperacillin. Exactly, exactly. Piperacillin is the antibiotic which acts against Pseudomonas and Tazobactam is beta lactamase inhibitor. So they always should be given together. Piperacillin with Tazobactam. This is a combination. So Pseudomonas is the answer. Excellent. Vancomycin is given for which organism? Vancomycin. MRS. Say methicillin resistant step step phalococcus aureus. Good. Excellent answer. So this is called MRSA strain of Staphylococcus aureus. Okay. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus should be treated by vancomycin. That's the perfect answer. Or you can also modify your answer a little bit. Any gram positive organism, especially cocci, if they are drug resistant, I can go for vancomycin. Clindamycin is for anaerobe. Clindamycin is the drug for anaerobe. See this? This is a very good combination. So it can be used. But let me remind again your, your uh, choice uh, may change later on after you get the sensitivity report if a culture grows in the lab. So till that time, this is a good combination. And another thing, we always examine the patient every day, okay? Uh, even uh, in that 24 hour, many times inside the hospital. If we believe our antibiotic combination is not working in that patient, we should always upgrade it. So even before that anti sensitivity report comes, if necessary, okay, we should upgrade the antibiotic. So these are very, very important knowledge. Now, if a high index of suspicion, take to theater immediately, operation theater, then go for aggressive surgical debridement. This is aggressive. You don't save those tissue which are already infected. Don't do that. Don't even think about that. You should remove it aggressively. Then only there is hope of survival. Diagnosis is confirmed by visual examination of the tissue. And then we send the tissue sample for microscopic evaluation. Isn't it? Every student know that now. So first is a visual confirmation. And by looking, we, we already know this is a case of necrotizing fasciitis, but still we want to confirm which organism are responsible. Now samples of involved and clinically uninvolved fascia taken with clean instrument for gram stain, culture and sensitivity, and histology or histopathology. One of the example of that is called urgent frozen section. Urgent frozen section. Now you are doing your surgery and right, right then you, you have sent okay, the one, one tissue sample to the pathology lab. They can quickly give you the report and accordingly you can plan your management. This is called frozen section biopsy. The, the report will be very quick. The packing of the wound can be done with antiseptic soaked gauze, okay, after extensive debridement. Now, what are the further management? What are the further management after this? Now, we have already done extensive debridement. We have already started antibiotics, okay, and some general management, like if the patient is in shock, we have given enough fluid already. After that, compulsory surgical exploration should be done around 24 to 48 hours later again. Now, this should be done to exclude the extension of the infectious process in the nearby area. This has to be done because this is a serious infection. Some tissues may be left behind, some infection may be left behind, and it must have you know, extended to the nearby area. It should be repeated more frequently if the patient is still very toxic. Toxic means infected, like if the patient is having high grade fever, okay? If the patient is persistently having tachycardia, then it should be done more frequently or more often, that's the meaning. Regular inspection of the wound should be done. Exposed structures like tendon and nerve 
should be kept from desiccating by moist dressing. They would be dry. Desiccating means they would become dry. And after getting dried, those nerves may be destroyed. So we should prevent them. We should you know, protect them by doing moist dressing. Cover those wounds with a moist dressing. That's the meaning. And at the same time, do not forget about the nutritional management of the patient. Okay, Supply enough nutrition to the patient. Because this is a serious disease, who knows, patient is already immunocompromised, so nutrition should be supplied. Now, some important points are still left behind. There is a big wound left. A lot of skin is lost, subcutaneous tissue is lost, and muscle is also lost. So how we, okay, how we reconstruct that area? So this regional reconstruction is done by skin graft, regional flap or free flap. Okay, this regional flap or free flap is some sort of muscle flap or some tissue flap which is used there to reconstruct the area from where we have lost the tissue. This has to be done, but this is done after the person gets better. It, it is not done right that time when we are doing debridement. Okay, the infection should be, uh, you know, eradicated first. Then, after some time, it should be done. Amputation is one of the modality of treatment, especially if it is rapidly spreading in the extremity, in the limbs. Amputation can be done only in the limbs, not in other parts, isn't it? So, uh, it, it is one of the options. Now, it is a very difficult decision for the doctors or the surgeon, and of course for the family or that patient. So who will decide now? How to decide? A big question. And the answer is to save the life. If there is no other option left, we only go for amputation. Okay, it is only for saving the life of this patient. Okay, so this is a very critical decision. Now, another type of therapy which can be done, I already mentioned this thing before is hyperbaric oxygen therapy now hyperbaric means we give oxygen under pressure oxygen should be given under pressure now this therapy is done for anaerobic organism now there this is a polymicrobial type of uh, infection so anaerobic organism are also present there so to kill those anaerobic organism along with surgical debridement hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be given.